we're on Twitch here with Signum Academy. Here we are. First Monday in April. Happy April. Happy Easter. And it's feeling like spring here. I hope it's nice where you are. Uh, so on the West Coast, we're at 4.30 p.m., but on the East Coast, 7.30 for Signum purposes, all times Eastern. So maybe it's more in the evening if you're watching over there. Uh, this is our final book by Rosemary Sutcliffe and the final book in her King Arthur legendarium called The Road to Cam Lan, The Death of King Arthur. The cover here is pretty uh pretty bleak you've got all the dead trees if you can look past the middle school barcode from the library this was uploaded from you can just see these two kind of sketchy figures of the king and his loyal knight uh, and it is just a depressing looking book i don't know if this is the kind of cover that would make you want to pick up a book but that uh first chapter this time the darkness beyond the door i think does a pretty nice job of pulling us in so let's start here when the darkness crowds beyond the door and the logs on the hearth burn clear red and fall in upon themselves making caverns and ships and swords and dragons and strange faces in the heart of the fire that is the time for storytelling come closer then and listen, the story of King Arthur is a long, long story woven of many strands and many colors, and it falls naturally into three parts. So most of this first chapter, it turns out, is going to deal with this first part. The, fall, the father of Arthur, the enchanter Merlin, uh, the sword in the stone, we get Morgan Le Fay, in case we forgot who she is, because she kind of been absent from the story for quite a while here. Um, and the sword uh, from the lake, that is Excalibur. Uh, Guinevere and the Round Table are introduced there. And then all the knights, and we get kind of the short list of the great knights. And we even have Sir Thomas Mallory mentioned here. I think this is pretty cool. Each of them brought their own story, and men have told and retold them ever since. Minstrels singing to the harp in a prince's hall. Monks in chilly cloisters writing upon sheets of vellum for the making of books. A Lancastrian knight called Sir Thomas Mallory, weaving tales and songs together in a narrow prison cell. Lancelot... Geraint and Enid, Gareth and Linnet, Gawain, the Green Knight, Tristan and Isolt, Percival. So that all forms the first part. And as she says, I have told this in an earlier book, The Sword and the Circle. I talked about The Sword and the Circle. Really enjoyed it. Uh, the second part, after the coming of Percival, there follows the story of the Holy Grail. And... This gets really just a few paragraphs. She's retold this in The Light Beyond the Forest. Uh, and as this wraps up with the conclusion of the Grail quest, specifically how Lancelot experiences it, then we get this very brief intro to the third book. And so the great days, the shining days of the round table were over, and the long, many-colored, many-stranded story of King Arthur Pendragon turns to its third part, the last and the darkest, the part which in this book I have called The Road to Camelot. So, in the previous two books, she has given us a kind of introduction and she always talks about jousting and feasts. Uh, this book 
she jumps right into the story, but in this first chapter, we're mostly getting kind of a recap of the previous books. A fair amount about the setup of the Arthur story, and a tiny bit about the Grail quest, which as we talked about, is rather hard to describe in the first place. And then a very, very small glimpse into what we can expect in this third book. It's dark. And I think it's kind of cool that Rosemary Sutcliffe gives that connection between the second book, The Light Beyond the Forest, and this first chapter, The Darkness Beyond the Door. So they're almost opposite ends of a spectrum of light and darkness. So in the beginning of this book, the setup is already pretty clear. We're going to see the end of King Arthur, the death of Arthur. We're going to see the breaking up of the round table and the fall of the kingdom. So how this happens is introduced with the poisoned apple. So the story really gets going in chapter two here with the poisoned apple. And that title alone might make you think about some things. Uh, there is a famous poisoned apple in the fairy tale, uh, Snow White. Uh, if you've seen the Disney version, I think that's a pretty good image that might come to mind here. Uh, an attempt to take advantage of her innocence and her uh, essentially tricking her. And that makes sense given the way that poison works. It's something you do secretively, right? Behind the scenes, it is treacherous. It is deceitful. And then the apple, of course, is the perfect way to disguise that because the apple looks so tasty and scrumptious. It's, uh, uh, of course, also one of the first stories in the creation in the Bible after everything's made, all the animals, then we have Adam in the garden, and then Eve, and then we get the apple. The serpent tells Eve to take the apple and eat it, and then she tells Adam, hey, take it, eat it, and they do. And this is the one thing they were not supposed to do. They were forbidden. And so the story of eating an apple uh, should probably make make us think of that too. Um, the apple was not technically poisoned, but the outcome was not so good. Uh, they were expelled from the garden and uh, forced to work and feel pain. And it uh, is it is a very very central story. Uh, for pretty much everything that comes after it. So we've talked a lot about um, chivalry and being virtuous and f sort of honorable in these stories of the Knights of the Round Table, the way that King Arthur might not be the best fighter, but has this vision for how his knights are supposed to represent uh, a different way of of upholding justice, not just being the strongest and doing whatever they want, but using their power and their might to help others, protect the innocent. So all of that is, I think, really called into question in this book, uh, much more than the others, although we always see you know, evil knights, uh, evil uh, sorcerers and such in these kind of stories. In this case, it's it's way more insidious. It's 
it's way more tricky because it's not just anyone who is going to do this this treachery with the poison apple. It's Arthur's own son. So we've got to introduce at this point the character of Mordred. Mordred. And I I noticed there are some people watching here live. If you have any questions, if something is not making sense, then please feel free to ask and put them in the chat there. Uh, and if you're watching this afterwards, you can always send in questions and comments uh, at our email. But here's Mordred. He's very like his father to look upon, but cast in a lighter and slighter mold. Whereas Arthur was brown-skinned and had been fair-headed like a hayfield at harvest time before his hair became streaked with gray, Mordred had the pallor of something reared in a dark cellar far from the light and air. Pale skin, pale hair, eyes, pale and opaque and veined with brilliant blue like turquoise matrix, so that no man could ever see what went on behind them. A voice light and pleasant and somehow pale, too. He was a leader of men in his way, though it was not the way of his father. But he could set fashions that men would follow, fashions for wearing black garments for playing with a flower or a feather between his fingers, a fashion for thinking and secretly speaking ill of the queen with the shrug of the shoulders and a little laugh. So there's something about Mordred that is untrustworthy, and it's connected with his pallor, his paleness, that he isn't an outdoors kind of person. He isn't a red-blooded sort of like his father or the other knights. Uh, I was about to say a red-blooded American, but of course we're in uh, myth mythical, legendary Britain, so that wouldn't make sense. But I think that gets the point across pretty well, actually. He is a... He's a sneaker. He sneaks around. He's fashionable, wearing black. He's a little bit like the emo... If you all remember the emo fashion from a while ago, uh, or the goth fashion that kind of highlights things like a person's eyes um, by darkening all around the rest. So he has this kind of uh, sense of himself uh, as being pretty important, and he can get away with talking badly about the queen. Now, there isn't really a reason for this that's explained in the story, and I think that's one of the big mysteries at the heart of this book, actually, is what is going on with Mordred. Um, we're left to sort of figure that out for ourselves. So here's what she says, uh, Rosemary Sutcliffe's take on this. Mordred had nothing against the queen herself, but he had not been at court seven days before his subtle mind had divined the love between Guinevere and Lancelot, the foremost of the king's knights and his dearest friend, and how the king himself took care not to know, never to recognize, even to himself, that that love existed. Guinevere was the weak place in the king's defenses. Lancelot and Guinevere together were the way through which he might be reached and brought to ruin, and all that he stood for with him. And Mordred hated his father, the high king, and coveted his throne, as Margos, his mother and Arthur's half-sister, had taught him to do through all his childhood and his growing years. So there you go. He doesn't hate Guinevere exactly. He sees that she is the way to get to his father, and he hates his father and covets his throne. He doesn't hate him because he covets his throne. He hates him because that's what he's been taught to do. So this is just the way he's been brought up. And again, that goes to his sort of unnatural, unhealthy kind of tinge. He is a hateful young man. Uh, and at this point, he starts to set his plan into motion. 
So he's going to frame Guinevere for killing Gawain, one of his own close relatives, um, because Gawain loves apples so much. They're going to poison one of the apples, make sure that it's in front of him. And of course, someone else, Sir Patrice, eats the apple instead. And in the same instant, he began to choke. And of course, they, uh, Mordred doesn't have to accuse the queen directly. Um, they all can sort of put this together that uh, as the host of this little party, it must have been her. Um, this is the first of the uh, points at which we see these two approaches to power. Right? The way that Mordred uses power, being deceitful, uh, tricking, and framing, and sneaking around, this kind of hateful approach. And it's up against our classic roundtable chivalry, defending the innocent, and frankly, fighting and beating people up. So being the best warrior. And the way this is presented is that for the queen to prove her innocence, she would have to fight against her accuser, Sir Mador. So she, of course, isn't going to fight personally. So a champion, someone has to stand up for her to prove her innocence. Um, so instead of you know, a court in a trial before a judge, making arguments, showing evidence. Instead of all of that, we have the trial by combat. So whoever wins the fight, that proves that they are are chosen by God, essentially, and have the right on their side. So there's this problem with King Arthur's whole project here, uh, and it seems to be a problem about how to settle disputes, how to, how to settle conflicts. To prove who's right, Arthur doesn't have any better system than the, the fight, the physical combat. So this world is still operating on the belief that whoever can fight the best must be the best. All that Arthur's done is kind of channel that and corral it and put it into a system where a little less injustice might happen uh, because more people are willing to stand up and be those champions for those who can't fight, who aren't able or aren't allowed to prove their own innocence. So it starts out as Sorbors standing up for the queen, but Ultimately, of course, Lancelot comes rushing back in the nick of time and rescues her. Uh, he fights in disguise, but it's him, of course, and people recognize him right away. And they're glad. They're very happy that he's done this. But all the same, Mordred's plan works well enough. He gets Lancelot back in the picture so that he can catch the two of them, Guinevere and Lancelot, together and prove to Arthur that they've been betraying him. That seems to be Mordred's plan. So he doesn't catch him this time. We have this kind of crazy uh, middle sort of period in the story here where Guinevere is almost taken away, kidnapped, by yet another knight, Sir Meliagrance, um, because again, Lancelot has tried to leave her alone, to try to stay away from her. And their conflict here is really pretty striking. So this comes in the Guinevere Rides a Maying chapter. Uh, Lancelot insists that he has never loved anyone else. 
and then he goes ahead and tells her what happened to him in the quest for the grail that his love for her prevented him from achieving the grail quest and she says I wish I could disbelieve you for if it were another lady another love I could fight her I could win you back from her as I won you back from Elaine the lily but you are hiding from me behind God and God I cannot fight go then and be at peace with God you say that you tear your own heartstrings when you turn from me, but do you not see that all this while you are tearing mine? Go, go, be happy with your God and never come near me again. This is a huge turning point for, I think, our sense of what the love between Lancelot and Guinevere is all about. Uh, on Lancelot's side, it has already been really complicated for a while because Arthur's his best friend and his lord. Um, he's doing this sort of romantic thing, but it's more than that. It's also that he was the best knight for a time, and in a way, but he lost his title. He'd fell from his top position because of this sinful love, as he says. It prevents him from making it all the way to the grail. Uh, his own son, Galahad, of course, is the champion of that quest. And on the other hand, we see from Guinevere's point of view that she takes love to be a kind of contest. It's the kind of fight that she can win. right? As long as she's fighting in a fair fight against other women, she thinks she could win Lancelot's love back. But she can't fight against God. And she is terribly distraught by this. Um, she wanted him, and now she's actually driving him away out of a kind of despair um, because she can't compete uh, with his with his devotion or his anyway his intention to be faithful so as a result of this falling out she goes on her um, ride through the forest this um, maying thing where you you ride around and you dress up and you pick flowers you sing uh, as they go along melia grants this wicked knight comes out and takes her back to his castle so we see Again, sort of like a miniature version of the sort of thing that used to happen all the time before Arthur set up the round table, uh, before, before his knights imposed this this rightful order. Um, and this is very bad, of course, and he doesn't seem to care. He seems so caught up with his own love or at least his passion for Guinevere. So he is like sort of an image of the worst part of what Lancelot feels. Right? If Lancelot was just going to act on what he felt, maybe that's what he would be like. And then once more, Lancelot has to come to a rescue. This time it comes in the form of a dream. So it's almost a kind of vision that Lancelot gets here. He says he was gifted or maybe cursed with the power of dreaming truth. So it's unclear whether this is a gift or a curse. Is it a good thing for him to go rescue her? Is it a bad thing? Uh, it's certainly a very dishonorable thing, in one way anyway, because he comes to the castle in the back of a cart. And this image of the knight riding the cart is supposedly very shameful. It is the way that you would get taken to the gallows, to, to be 
killed, to be executed. So this is something that Lancelot has done, again, out of his love for Guinevere, he has lowered himself. He has fallen as a knight. But by the end of this series of events, after he rescues her, he comes back in time to work this miracle for this wounded knight who's come to the castle in search of the greatest knight in the world, Sir Ura. This is like a little echo of the whole grail quest. This wounded knight, kind of like the wounded king of Pelis. So King Arthur and all his knights cry out in joy and kneeling bow their heads and give thanks to God for his mercy. But kneeling still beside the empty litter, Sir Lancelot covered his face with his big swordsman's hands and wept like a little child that has been beaten. It's the miracle he has prayed for all his life. He's finally done a miracle. He's proven to be the best knight in the world at this point. Maybe it's too late for Lancelot. Maybe it's too late. Maybe he too can sense that the darkness is closing in. The ruin of the round table is coming. The high point of the Grail quest is past. Galahad and Percival, the greatest knights of that quest, are gone. And they are now just watching the downfall of all that they had fought for. Uh, people within Arthur's own court are now betraying each other. Um, Guinevere has essentially forsaken Lancelot, or at least said that to his face, told him to leave her. Um, now, of course, after rescuing her, maybe he has a chance again, and he can't really prevent himself now. He's, he's hit his high point. He can't prevent himself from, from falling. So this really, these first few chapters really set up the entire kind of the, the, the falling apart, the, the loosening of the round table and uh, the downfall of Arthur. Um, the rest of the chapters are pretty much going to show us that process, that slow, steady, and then faster and faster how things start to come apart. Uh, it's um, mostly going to be about Lancelot, but Gawain, so sort of the other major knight that's still around from the old days, Gawain is going to be another important participant here. So I'll leave you guys with this for today. Uh, I hope that you get a chance to read the rest of this book. Uh, if you have already read it all, you can, of course, uh, kind of dig in more to some of the source material that Rosemary Sutcliffe talks about in her other introductions, and she kind of throws it in there in the first chapter here, too, about Sir Thomas, uh, Sir Thomas Mallory uh, being this storyteller. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, C.S. Lewis talks about reading Mallory, uh, and he is sort of the, the classic example of the Arthur stories. But like I've talked about before, another great one to look into is the T.H. White retelling. Um, I remember the ending, the final part of, of that series, being really, really powerful as well. Um, so those are a couple of things that you might want to look into. Uh, and we'll kind of wrap up the King Arthur legend next time. We'll look at the friendships, the loyalties, the betrayals between Gawain, Lancelot, Arthur, Mordred, and the rest. Um, Guinevere's role in this. And some of the kind of strange things that happen right at the very end of the story we'll also look at. 
that's the one place where maybe there's still some hope uh, in this very um, sort of melancholy, sad uh, final book of the series. Uh, so thanks again, all those who tuned in here, uh, all those who are watching after the fact. You can always shoot us an email. Um, I meant to show you what's new at the Signum Academy webpage. Um, it might not look very different than it has before, but if I've, as I've mentioned, we've got this new program in connection with Learn Everywhere in New Hampshire that is the clubs. And we have starting this week, I believe, a book club, a writing club, and a translation club. Um, so check those out. You can still sign up, of course. They're the kind of thing you can drop in anytime. Um, I'd love to get enough people going uh, into the conversation one. That's the one I would be running. Um, but of course, uh, these ones do cost some money. Uh, meanwhile, the Twitch streams will be free forever. Uh, this um, uh, two weeks from now on Monday, we'll meet again to discuss the rest of the road to Camlan and uh, conclude the King Arthur stories. So thank you all. I'll uh, ride off into the sunset here for now and see you next time.